OPEC, or the Organization of the Petroleum Exporting Countries, is one of the most controversial organizations on the planet. Loved by some and loathed by others, the organization has been around for over 60 years. And during that time, it's had a huge impact, supplying over 40% of the world's oil and possessing a staggering 80% of total reserves. Headquartered in Vienna, a location chosen for its neutrality, OPEC's alleged purposes include coordinating the policies of its 13 member countries, ensuring the stabilization of oil markets, a steady supply to consumers, and perhaps most importantly, providing a steady income and fair capital return. Over the years, the biggest problem businesses, consumers, and governments alike have had is that it acts as a cartel manipulating the production of oil amongst its members to influence global prices, something it has achieved through a variety of methods, including quotas, price bandings, and even secret output formulas. The way the cartel operates isn't new to the sector though. You see, before OPEC, there were the infamous Seven Sisters, referring to seven Western oil companies, which by and large controlled world oil output. These firms dominated the industry by being vertically integrated across the five operations of the oil industry. Exploration, extraction, refining, transportation, and marketing. By 1950, only 10 years before OPEC was founded, the Seven Sisters controlled about 92% of global crude reserves, including 99% of output from the Middle East. Yet, times were changing. The end of colonialism ushered in the rise of the sovereign state, and with it, OPEC, perhaps most famous for the 1973 oil embargo, which led to the tripling of the price of oil from three to $12 a barrel and a global recession. And that embargo has lingered on in people's minds, being a potent reminder of the impact OPEC can have to make or break economies. Well, at least that was historically. Analysts have speculated that in recent years, its grip on world oil markets has diminished. Since 2000, total world production of crude oil has grown by 17%, whereas the output of non-OPEC producers has grown even more, by 21%. Nothing outlines this shift more than the rise of new oil sources, particularly shale oil. Its meteoric rise has enabled the US to overtake Saudi Arabia to become the world's largest producer, but importantly, not the largest exporter. Nonetheless, this trend helps explain the emergence of OPEC+, Plus, a creative acronym which accounts for OPEC cutting output deals with non-members, most notably Russia. And these deals have quickly become important, with the 2020 crash in oil prices being blamed in part on the failure of Russia and Saudi Arabia to reach a deal on oil output, alongside the general crash in demand and its uses, suggesting OPEC, or at least OPEC Plus, is still by far the dominant player in the market. Now, for the purposes of this video, we are going to assume that OPEC never existed, as opposed to ceasing to exist. So, what would a no OPEC scenario look like? Imagining a counterfactual scenario of no OPEC doesn't mean its members wouldn't produce millions of barrels of oil. One way to imagine a world without OPEC is to consider the balancing role it plays through its spare capacity cushion. This is crucial in two ways. Firstly, the presence of spare capacity enables OPEC to maintain price stability by increasing production when prices are high. Secondly, when prices are low, OPEC can implement this spare capacity to lower output. Crucially, the idea of spare capacity is essential to OPEC's whole strategy. So, a good way to view a world without OPEC is to assume all members ignored spare capacity, producing at their maximum to gain revenue. Now, at this point, some may suggest that spare capacity exists without OPEC anyway. And, well, this is true, but nowhere near the scale of member countries. For example, Saudi Arabia, one of the most prominent members of OPEC, has the world's greatest additional capacity. In fact, this is part of its business strategy, playing a fundamental role as a swing producer, meaning it routinely tops up or reduces output to help influence price, swinging its production in the process. Any country which is a member of the International Energy Agency which includes most of Europe, Japan, Australia, and the US, 
is required to maintain 90 days of net oil imports in public storage. But this isn't productive spare capacity, it's a fixed amount. So what could be the impact of no spare capacity? The behaviour of oil prices depends not only on current supply and demand, but where markets think they will be in future. This is incredibly difficult to predict, as markets are subject to unforeseen supply and demand side shocks. Whether that's an attack on a nation's production facilities, a war, or an embargo. Importantly, in a world without a spare capacity cushion, the price volatility caused by these shocks would be much, much greater and price volatility is key here. A study looking into this found price volatility would have been almost twice as large in a world with no spare capacity. Now, if there is one thing economies, businesses and households like less than higher prices, it's extreme volatility, which would make budgeting and effective decision making extremely difficult. Somewhat counterintuitively, despite the widespread belief that OPEC increases oil prices, there would have been regular periods where a non-OPEC world would have in fact led to higher prices. You see, whilst maximum production would increase overall supply, limited spare capacity would have left very little in the tank, literally, to counter pinch points when demand spiked or supply was hit by an unexpected shock. For example, if there wasn't any spare capacity in 2012 when prices surged, the price of Brent crude would have been higher by $46 a barrel. And likewise, during periods of falling prices, we would have seen sharper drops as supply wouldn't have been restricted. One study tried to quantify the cost of a lack of spare capacity, looking back at the last decade. It found that the global welfare loss would have been $360 billion a year by 2017 roughly equivalent to Malaysia's entire economy, and rising. And as countries would be producing at or close to their maximum capacity, any price shock, particularly on the upside, would take longer to sort out, as supply wouldn't be able to increase overnight. You'd have to build up additional capacity, which is a huge investment and a real risk. Now, you may be thinking, why would countries, particularly OPEC ones, ever take steps to lower price? Surely the higher the price, the better. Well, yes, up to a point. There is a careful balancing act between getting a good price and not squeezing the market so hard that you dampen economic growth, a concern which has historical justification. Higher oil prices were a contributing factor behind every US recession between World War II until the 1980s. So, speaking of impacts, what would be the impact in this scenario on OPEC members? Well, as mentioned, a non-OPEC scenario doesn't mean member states wouldn't possess vast quantities of oil, or not be overly dependent on it as a revenue stream. However, in truth, members have little in common besides being members. Even where oil is found, and the price it can be extracted at, varies. If anything, the cheating and conflict shown by members regarding production quotas over the years shows just how deeply divided and conflicting their economic interests actually are. Out of all the nations, Saudi Arabia would likely have seen the biggest increase in output, both in real and proportional terms. This stems from its role as a swing producer, with the highest spare capacity built up over decades. Not to mention that the kingdom has one of the cheapest extraction processes, meaning any supply-driven drop in price is less likely to damage its ability to turn a profit something which cannot be said for all OPEC members. Yet, a move to cheaper oil through maximum production would still be bad for Saudi Arabia. As we discussed in our video on the economy of Saudi Arabia, the kingdom still requires an oil price over $76 a barrel to balance its state budget. And this highlights an obvious but important point for most OPEC members that petroleum income has seriously distorted their economies, leading commentators to suggest that the Dutch disease, which is the negative impact on an economy of a sharp inflow of foreign currency because of natural resources, doesn't really go far enough to explain their over-reliance on the dinosaur juice. Instead, commentators have coined the term the OPEC disease, with most members seriously distorting their entire economies over decades displaying a gross over-reliance in government revenues on oil export income. 
Perhaps the perfect example of this is Venezuela, an economy which was almost single-handedly run into the ground due to poor resource management and even poorer state governance. But in truth, OPEC only exacerbated an underlying trend. These were by and large problems in their own right, not ones spawned by the organisation. However, just as interesting is how non-OPEC countries would fare. What could be the impact on non-OPEC members? Well, on the one hand, we've noted how cheaper oil for consumers would spur economic growth and wider consumption. Great. But researchers suggest that any supply disruptions in a world already operating at maximum capacity with an inelastic supply curve would produce negative effects through volatile pricing, which more than offset cheaper fuel. Also, cheaper fuel isn't necessarily a good thing for all non-OPEC members. A lot of countries have discovered and developed their own oil industries, which are typically more expensive to extract than OPEC members. These more expensive operations were in part facilitated by OPEC's quest for higher prices for oil, meaning lower prices would have made domestic oil industries, like offshore rigs or fracking, a financial non-starter. And these aren't just some fringe industries. Exploration and production activity is a huge employer. Oil and gas drilling accounts for about 4% of total global GDP. In the US, for example, oil and gas account for about 8% of GDP, with the sector accounting for one-sixth of all US capital investment between 2012 and 2016. But saying all of this, is a world without OPEC likely? One way to consider this is to look at a piece of US legislation. A few years ago, the US was considering passing the No Oil Producing and Exporting Cartels Act, otherwise known as a NOPEC bill, which would have put serious pressure on OPEC to disband its operations. Yet, the bill never passed, given the serious harm it was suspected to do to national interests. In fact, 16 NOPEC bills have been proposed over the last 20 years, but none of them have been signed into law which just goes to highlight the organisation's continued importance over the years, even in non-member states, regardless of whether or not its role has been diminished. So overall, we've seen that OPEC hasn't been the first attempt of the oil industry to influence price if we look at the Seven Sisters. A core attribute of OPEC is its spare capacity, something it uses to influence price. In the absence of spare capacity, production would most likely have been higher over the years but so would price volatility, as supply struggled to match shocks to the market. For OPEC members themselves, the impacts of a no OPEC scenario would vary alongside their existing spare capacity and cost of production. Yet for non-members, whilst lower prices overall may be considered a good thing, the prospects of higher prices and huge swings in times of market stress are estimated to more than offset any pricing gains. Not to mention the amount of economic activity the sector generates for the global economy, which just underpins, if anything, how important the sector remains. Now, this is only one take among many of the economic impacts of a what if OPEC never existed scenario. In all honesty, no what if scenario could cover all eventualities, especially for something so essential as oil. And that's why we found this topic such an intriguing one. So now it's time for you to let us and your fellow watchers know what your thoughts are in the comments below. And as a bonus for making it this far into the video, we'd like to ask your ideas on what future what if economic scenarios you'd like covered. The best ideas you come up with will go to a public vote. If you enjoyed this video half as much as we enjoyed making it, please consider leaving a like and subscribing. It really helps grow this channel. And as always, see you in the next video.